Hi there, and welcome back to The Fuse Show. Today I'm joined by Misha Esipov. He's the CEO of Nova Credit, where he co-founded with Nikki and Lo uh, Luke uh, that he met, some friends that he met at, uh, as graduate students at Stanford University. The company began as a research project in 2015 and has since evolved into the premier cross-border credit reporting agency. Before founding Nova Credit, Misha was a private equity investor at Apollo Global Management, a $232 billion global, asset, global alternative asset manager. Uh, Misha started his credit, uh, career at Goldman Sachs, where he helped execute more than $10 billion in corporate financing mergers and acquisitions. Misha was born in Russia and immigrated to the United States after the fall of the Soviet Union. He holds a BS in mathematics and finance from New York, uh, New York University and an MBA from Stanford Graduate Business. Thanks for joining us on the show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, David. You sound like a person who's lived in a lot of different places in your lifetime. Do you uh, have a... Uh, do you have different lessons you've learned in living in different parts of the world? Um, I haven't lived in that many parts of the world. I, mean, I, I was born in Russia um, during the Soviet Union. Uh, I spent the first you know, few years of my life there, but I, I was just a kid. And then I came over to the U.S. Um, as a child, lived in like upstate New York, lived in the Midwest for, for a few years in Illinois and Wisconsin, and then moved to the beautiful state of New Jersey. Um, for, for uh, most of middle school and high school and then New York City for almost a decade and then um, came out to California for grad school um, where I've been for seven years, almost seven years now. Um, That's a good amount of life experience in my opinion. Good amount. I've currently... lived in Singapore as well for about six months for study abroad, oh, sure. uh, which was pretty cool. Um, but, but yeah, I've, I've, I've bounced around the world a, a fair bit. I've, you know, I've had the, the pleasure and luxury of being able to uh, travel a fair bit, um, and yeah, do you know? I think every one of those experiences kind of just helps you understand that people all over the world, as, as different as they may seem from the outside, are all just you know trying to be happy. That's <laughs> like trying to achieve something and, and, and be happy. A lot of our viewership are, I guess, in the United States. Do you feel like you had experiences that are less common amongst Americans, and what are some things you've learned from those? Um, I think the, you know, I think there's something very beautiful about, you know, about the American dream. Um, I think it's something that, you know, most, many or most immigrants that come to the U.S. Um, uh, dream for. I think it's one of the, the, the beauties of being part of a society where, you know, at least conceptually, um, anybody can, what you put enough hard work, effort, drive into your life and you have the potential to to rise in this society and I think it's you know it's one of the beauties of of the American system you know you, without getting into you know challenges of you know how that system may be equal or not as equal for, for, for certain people I think immigrants in general come here and they start over um, they start from scratch and it's a really difficult experience that you know my parents lived through that I you know I, I lived through at least in part as, as you know as coming here as a young kid. Um, but I think it's something that, you know, any American has to also, you know, pursue opportunity. And that's one of the beauties that this society can, can provide for those who want to put in the time, the effort um, to, to, to do their best to advance themselves. When did the American dream feel most real to you? Was it like as a, as a kid when you first came to America or was it in like your early college years? Like when did it really hit you and like, wow, this is a beautiful opportunity and I want to take advantage of it? I don't think I like, I was just like, I, mean, I still have some elements of this. I was just like such a striver. Like I've always been a very competitive person. I think you, you have to be to be an entrepreneur. Um, and you know, I, I busted my ass growing up. I, I worked a lot. I had part-time jobs all the time. Um, you know, I got into a, you know, a good undergraduate college and worked part-time all, almost all four of my years. and. Was just trying to trying to win, trying to like get ahead, trying to you know be on the path to to, to opportunity, um, and I got really lucky in certain certain ways. Um, got unlucky in other ways, and I don't think I really kind of found the time to, and really had the awareness to like take a step back and, and realize like wow, I'm I'm really lucky to be in this position uh, until really until moving to California, maybe like in grad school is where it kind of kind of sunk in and I was like, okay, 
Like I now, you know, I shouldn't be striving just for the sake of, of, of striving and pushing just to advance myself. Like I, I have the luxury of going in a lot of different directions um, in, in terms of how I, you know, what, what's the next chapter I want to live. Um, and that's actually one of the one of the moments where you know I kind of decided that entrepreneurship was something that you know, it was time to to jump off the steady path. Like I did, I did undergrad, I did you know worked in finance, did the banking thing, did the private equity thing, did the business school thing, and I was like, you know what? Like enough of like moving up along the path. It's time to actually you know take a leap of faith and, and take some risk and 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 like live that roller coaster. Do you have a North Star motivation that like really pushes you through? Because entrepreneurship is definitely no easy journey. And even though I, I, I'm pretty sure investment banking and private equity aren't easy either, there's at least the, the like a, a feeling of stability, like the fact that, oh, I can stay here for a while and at least I won't like financially suffer. Um, what's, what's their like guiding North Star right now? Um, I, I think for, for me, one of the most formative um, books I ever read uh, for, for me, particularly while I was like wrestling with like, do I go back to the finance world and like, you know, earn well and live a stable life and, um, you know, have a, you know, successful job or do I like risk it all and like take the leap of faith and, uh, and all that was this, this book by Robert Greene called Mastery. Basically the, the, I don't know if you've read it, um, David, but the, bo the book is, is basically you know, it's part philosophy, part like biography, and like part self-help. Uh, and the central premise of the book is essentially like the purpose of life is to master a craft. And in the early part of your career, you need to figure out like directionally what is that craft. That craft could be, you know, a subject. That craft could be something in business. It could be a discipline. It could be art. It could be parenting. It could be whatever, whatever whatever your, your heart is pulling you to. And for me, as I, as I started to like take a step off the like train of, you know, the, the financial world, um, it just became increasingly clear to me that I wanted to have a, I wanted to master the craft of like building an organization that can have an impact on the world. Um, that was something that was just like really exciting and, and, and motivating to me. I wanted to like, I felt some excitement and pride and ego around like having a, a lasting impact on the world that outlasts my own time uh, on, on, mm -hmm. on this, you know, on this planet. And um, sort of that, that was kind of one of the things that was pulling me conceptually in the direction of, of, of taking, a, taking a leap of faith and, and starting over credit. Did you, um, when you're making this transition in your career, did you have like naysayers either amongst your family or coworkers? Like, is that something you experienced? Yeah, I mean, it's like financially, it's like an irresponsible decision to start a company, um, particularly when you know you're, you're 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 fortunate to have the opportunity to work for some of the great companies I had the opportunity to work for, and um, you know, path A is like earn a lot of money with like very little downside, very little risk. Yeah, you have to work hard, but like you will never worry about putting food on the table or worry about your, you know, um, you know, being able to take your kids and put, and put them through college. And on the other path, at, at the time, emotionally, it was like, oh my God, like, this could, I could spend five, ten years and walk away with nothing. And, you know, you kind of just got to get, emotionally, you got to get to this place, and, and there's a whole process for how you, how you do it, of just like, that's okay. Like, it's not about whether this entrepreneurial path is a success or a failure. The journey itself is what makes life rich in um, being able to live uh, the adventure of it all. And yes, there are highs and there are lots of lows, um, but that is part of the process and that builds character and that, you know, that makes you a more interesting person that takes risks and like feels the journey of life. And I just increasingly, just became increasingly clear to me every time I'd like look myself in the mirror and be like, yep, I kind of have to like take this chance right now because otherwise I can't look at myself and feel authentic to who I am. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like there's this component of self-respect and I think a lot of people lose respect for themselves if they see the opportunity that they have and the compatibility with their personality, their interests, their passions. And when those two meet, I think it's really tough for a lot of entrepreneurs to say no, especially if they're, yeah, 
if they really want to build something of like legacy versus trying to optimize a pre-existing system. Yeah, but fi finding the actual like the courage to do that, that that took me like several years to like to like be comfortable taking the leap of faith because it just felt like the stakes were so high. Even though like in practice they they're not that high. Like you can always like take a step back and there's all there's other paths and like your learning skills as an entrepreneur that make you forever employable. Like at the time, it just mm -hmm. it feels like so high stakes. Like this pristine, you know, path that you've been on, a resume that you have is like now it's going to be tarnished uh, by like taking this this chance. But at the end of the day, like it's okay that you know if something does or doesn't work out, like you're going to learn an incredible set of skills that make you, you know, an, an ever more uh, sought after leader for people to work with. How many times, if at all? Did you feel like giving up in that journey, where you're like, "Oh, this isn't worth it. I should have stayed in corporate." Since actually like starting a business, or like in the path of trying to decide whether or not to to start. Um, particularly in your duration at Nova Credit. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I decided to stay in San Francisco rather than start the company in New York is because I knew that the temptation to go back into finance would have been strong uh, in New York, whereas in San Francisco, it would have felt embarrassing uh, to go <laughs> to go back to finance. Because like everybody, not everybody, but like almost everybody works in, in tech in San Francisco, which you know, has its pros and cons. Um, um, yeah, I mean, the early days there was a lot of like excitement about everything we could be, but also a lot of doubt. Like there are a lot of moments where, you know, everything you thought was right proved to be wrong uh, in the direction you were you were moving, and. Um, you know, the pandemic's another good example of that. Like, there were certainly days, weeks, months over the last year where I was like, w what are we doing here? <laughs> this is this is really hard. The market is just, like, got pulled out from under us. Um, and we, we can spend some more time on that later. But, um, yeah, that like, the, the, the doubts are, it, it's human. It, it makes you human to have those doubts. Like, it, it's part of, of the journey. And then it, there are tools and, you know, tricks that you develop that kind of help you like steady your mind and stay the course. And I, I think surrounding yourself with the right set of people, um, other founder circles, a coach, a therapist, an advisory board, mentors, or a real board of people who can help you kind of um, get out of, the, uh, out of a rut anytime you get there is absolutely critical to being able to keep pushing. What are some of the things that these people in your life, these advisors, your therapists, counselors, and board members, what would they, what would they do to help comfort you, help you bring, to bring you back to a mentally steady place? Um, so I'll give you a, a specific example. So we, we, we closed a, um, a, you know, a sizable Series B um, like a few weeks before the pandemic started. So time, timing was great. Mm. Um, but as part of that, we, you know, we had. Um, set some fairly ambitious um, targets for ourselves of like, here's what we think we can hit this year. And with the pandemic um, uh, taking place, it just became brutally obvious that like that wasn't going to happen. Like there's no amount of effort that could have made that happen in a year where the industry kind of shut down the way, the way it did, particularly ours. Um, and one of my... Um, one of our investors, um, Jeff Jeff Reitman, who's a he's a GP at Canopy, which uh, they're a, a relatively new um, enterprise-focused fintech fund. That I, I just think the world of those guys. Um, he, he called me and he's like, "Look, this year, like you had all these grand plans, and like we believe you that if the pandemic didn't happen, like you would have hit it. Um, you're not going to hit it. Like no matter what you do, you're not going to hit it. And so this year is kind of a wash. Like that's okay. And like we got lucky in terms of the timing of the B. You got plenty of capital." Like, you're gonna have to be patient. And that just helped like depressurize the situation a little bit and knowing that, you know, my board members and advisors were, um, you know, remain believers in the long-term thesis, which, you know, is, with, as the world's starting to reopen um, is, is, is increasingly proving to be true again. But at the time, it, it like, nobody knew, like, are, are, you know, is immigration gonna come back? Uh, how long are we gonna be in this pandemic period? Is it, is it quarters? Is it several years? Um, in theory, nobody still fully knows um, how long it's going to take. But there were some, certainly some dark days where we were questioning like the core, um, the core like thesis of the company. And you know, board members were really helpful in just like regrounding 
on like, look, we're still long-term right. Like the long-term direction is right. We hit a blip here because of the market. Like this happens. You remain in a strong capital position. Be patient. It's it's pretty cool and encouraging to hear that it's your board members telling you that because it's usually um, the CEO telling their panicked investors that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there's also like that conversation is also happening <laughs> in assuring them like long term we're right we're capitalized we're not going to run out of capital anytime soon um, you know here here are the actions we're going to take organizationally here are the actions we're going to take in terms of our product direction um, to you know to you know make sure that the company is is, is in a sustainable place um, but hearing the assurance back that like yep this makes sense and like you're long term right we believe in this. Um, that goes a long way to just kind of depressurizing um, a founder. So from the founders I talked to, I feel like there's this 50-50 split who feel like they're more stressed after having taken on funding, VC funding particularly, because they feel like they have a stewardship responsibility and weight of, I guess, responsibility to these investors. And the other half where they're stressed because they decide to go down the bootstrap route and they don't have capital for uh, unforeseen market experience, occurrences like COVID. Uh, where would you say you fall in that spectrum? Um, yeah, I mean, as soon as you bring in external capital, you have a fiduciary duty to those to those investors because they are your your partners, they're your, they're your shareholders. Um, so there's certainly some some more more pressure that comes from from that. Um, I think like the degree of that pressure can vary depending on the nature of the business and the state mm -hmm. that in like ours is a you know what our investors always describe our business is it's a j curve business it take it'll it has taken us several years to like build this global infrastructure that that, that we have uh, only then once it's once it's once it's assembled um you know can we start to grow and um you know compare that to you know many other business models where, from the very earliest of stages, they can be they can be growing, and investor pressure is actually helpful. But like ours is one that just had had a much longer incubation period to kind of pull all the pieces, um, all the pieces together. And you know, investor pressure um, too early is actually really counterproductive, in, in my opinion. We had um, we had a, one of our earliest investors kind of pushing like we need the hockey stick, we need the hockey stick now, like. Anything other than the hockey stick is not good. You won't be able to raise your next round. And I was just like, that doesn't make sense for our business. Like, I, we're not like a one size fits all kind of company. Like, it's going to take us a few years to assemble all these partnerships around the world, build all these integrations, you know, build our data models and analytical capabilities. And only then can we truly get to market. And you need to believe that there is a market there. And like, if you want to talk about that, let's talk about that. But like, solving for a hockey stick right now is just like creating false pressure and it's a distraction and that was bad advice um, at the time and so making sure that you're aligned with investors and setting expectations appropriately of like here are the pieces of the of the equation that need to come into place in order for the broader thesis to to work and finding investors who, who believe in that long term and are ready to be patient with you is is, is actually is absolutely critical a lot of the founders that I talk to, they're, it's their first time raising funding, uh, or at least first, time comp first company for which they're raising funding. Um, how did you know when to push back on investors to let them know, like, hey, like, you, you need to readjust your expectations to like, the, something that, I can, like, that you consider more realistic? Um, we've never really gotten that much push, to be honest, hmm. from, from our investors. Okay. We've always sort of really, really trusted our, our team um, in, you know, setting goals for ourselves. And um, like we set ambitious goals, we hit them as often as we can, we miss sometimes. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I, I think there's pros and cons. Like we're a business that doesn't have any direct competition, and that that has you know pros and cons. Like we're we're one of a kind category defining company. There's nobody else in the world, to our knowledge, that's, that's building or has built or is building anything similar to what to what we do. Um, and so like getting it right, uh, it is it is um, you know is really hard. Um, but you know the the lack of competition. Um, 
also makes it harder to like get that like that extra push and in, 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 you know in moving an organization faster than than it is um, already. Um, and so board helps with that, like being able to like align with your board on ambitious targets that you can then share with you, share with your organization. And be like we have to hit this um, to to keep moving in in the right direction. Um, so we, we've had a little bit of that, but in, in general, like the the drive and the ambition and the like the targets that's largely intrinsic to the organization and to our leadership. Hmm. One of the things you said was that this is a one of a kind business, and you're kind of in a, like blue ocean territory. How do you know when the blue ocean you're approaching is one that's like an actual blue ocean versus a like kind of dead sea where like people haven't gone there because it isn't a viable model? Like what? Well, what did you do to validate the demand in the market? Um, so maybe just a, a little bit on, on, on what we do um, because our the business actually formed through doing user research, right? We were, we were in grad school. Uh, we were just broadly interested in consumer finance and like how do consumers make financial decisions. Um, and, you know, I was doing 10 to 20 user interviews every week, just talking to classmates, talking to anybody who would, you know, spend 15, 20 minutes with me, asking, um, how do you make financial decisions? Like, how, you know, do you have a credit card? Where'd you get that credit card? Um, how, how'd you make that decision? Who'd you go to for advice? Do you have a student loan? What's the rate on that loan? How'd you decide that amount? Um, just asking very broad based, open-ended, non-leading questions. Um, hmm. And it became increasingly obvious that, um, and the, some of this is, is, is luck, but half of the people we were speaking with were recent immigrants. Um, and 100% of that half was like, this sucks. I, like, I can't get a credit card or an auto loan or a student loan. I have to go beg my classmate to put me on their family plan or to co-sign an apartment lease with me. Um, and we just kept hearing about the, the acuteness of a problem. And so like, the existence of a problem was, was very clear. The existence of a consumer problem was very clear um, from the very beginning just because we had done hundreds of user interviews to validate um, the problem. So that suggests that there, there is an ocean uh, out there, um, but the, like, the precise size of that ocean um, is, and, and whether or not like, it can be unlocked or is, whether it's alive versus dead, to use your, your analogy there, like that takes more time. And um, the, the size, like you, you, know, you, you do your desktop research and you look at you know, visa issue and statistics in our case and how many people are actually moving to the US each year and you know, what do we think we could reasonably charge for this product and what does that mean in terms of the size of the addressable market. Um, mm. And then on the, the question of alive or dead, like the, the central premise for our company was that, you know, foreign data um, now exists um, and that that data can be used to um, improve a decision in a new country. Like that's something that nobody had ever proven before. And so it took us, you know, well over a year to like go and sign our first credit bureau partnership. And I can, I can share more about like the nuances of our industry if it's of interest. Um, but the first one was Mexico, where we went to Mexico, we signed up one of the two credit bureaus, and we got access to that data, and then we went to a bunch of different potential customers, and we're like, hey, we can get you this data now, and so anybody from who recently moved from Mexico, we can get them approved. We don't know how predictive the data is. We, we hear all the qualitative arguments behind why we think it's going to be super predictive, but like empirically, I cannot prove it because it's proven and done. And so like, if that equation proved to be false, um, then that would have been a dead ocean. Then it's just like, well, the whole central premise of the company doesn't make sense if foreign data doesn't predict US performance. But like the qualitative argument was like, well, if you were a really good borrower in New York City and you moved to San Francisco, you're, like, you're, you're, gonna, the, same you're the same human being. Like your, your character as a human doesn't change, or uh, shouldn't change all that much. And so like it, it should be predictive, but to actually prove that empirically or convince a really conservative organization um, to take a leap of faith with us on that, that was hard. <laughs> um, um, and to the extent that that proved to be false, then like we wouldn't have a business. But fortunately, that that premise and many other premises that had to hold true um, um, held up, and like that's what's gotten our, our initial flywheel to, to work. What's the incentive, be it financial or, or soft incentive, for these credit bureaus to hand over information? Because I recognize that. Uh, data is just really precious and most companies don't want to give up any data unless they absolutely have to or are forced by like the law. Yeah. 
So, so the, the, the credit bureau industry, maybe to just like speak a little bit about what it sure. is and, and how it works. Um, you know, the, it's been around for, in, in, you know, in the case of Equifax, over a hundred years. Um, they receive data from any, basically all lenders. So let's use the U.S. ecosystem. They get they get furnished information from ten thousand plus different data furnishers. These are banks that are saying, "Hey, uh, I have an account. David has an account with us, uh, and here are some details about that account." And every month, David did or didn't make his payment on time. So bureaus are receiving that information for free. They are um, they'll see like, "Oh, David's got an account with Chase, and you have an account with SoFi." Um, and that's the same David based on all these different parameters and that social security number. And so they start to create a credit report. And for aggregating that information, normalizing it across all the furnitures and then building scores, attributes, analytics on top, they will sell that back for a fee. So they're in the business of selling data. Um, and that exists all over the world. Credit, credit bureaus exist um, to support the safety and soundness of consumer lending markets without them. Like you cannot sustain a consumer lending market. So as much as you know, uh, many people um, you know hate on the credit bureaus, and, and yes, they're imperfect, but they do serve an incredible amount of good in enabling the you know the U.S. consumer market, consumer lending market, to exist. Like without it, it just it wouldn't operate as mm -hmm. well, um, nearly nearly as well. And yes, there are kinks in, in, in their armor and opportunities to improve, and that, that's awesome that there are ways to, to, to be better. Uh, and you know, our specific wedge is, is a really fascinating one. Um, but when, coming back to your, the, the central part of your question, you know, if you're a, the, the original pitch was like, hey, if you're you know, one of the Mexican credit bureaus, you've got um, you know, 50, 60 million credit reports um, in Mexico, but by the way, there's over 20 million Mexican Americans. And anytime somebody moves from Mexico to the US, that's a revenue opportunity for you. I see. Um, and so not, not only can we enable you to better monetize your data asset um, into a new market so we can be like a channel for you, but it's also creates a lot of good. Um, it, it enables that person to get a leg up when they first land um, in a new country. And so it's, it's a win-win, right? Mm -hmm. It's good for the credit bureau because um, you know, they're making more money. It's good for the consumer because they have a chance of using their foreign data to improve their odds of approval. Um, and it's a win for, 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 the, um, for the lender in the US because they're able to book a new account um, that they otherwise had no information to enable them to, to, to land. And so our, our reason for existing is you know, we've built data infrastructure technology to link together a consumer, a foreign credit bureau and a, and a US uh, enterprise, a, a lender or, or a real estate company or a, a telecom company. We link those together to plug an information gap using better data. So you've talked about the side of foreign credit bureaus providing reports. How do you convince an American lender to accept these reports, and how do you like help them understand how they translate to an American equivalent? That's a nightmare. Okay, that's what I figured. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, if I'm just like totally honest. Hey, difficulty um, is your business mode. It's gonna be so hard to copy your business model if it's so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, like I don't think there's anyone that you know. Well, I don't. I shouldn't go and in, in, in singing singing this out too loud, but like. I wish anybody, if anybody on this podcast wants to try to build this business, like, good luck. <laughs> like it's, uh, it's, you know, you're gonna have to fly all the way around the world. You're gonna have to set up partnerships. You're gonna have to meet regulators, and, and only then do you have enough data to be able to, um, you know, credibly go to these banks and try. Like it is just, had I known how hard this would be, you know, like it, it, I don't know if we would have gotten started. Like it, it requires a a business like this requires a certain level of like ego and naivety <laughs> to think that. Like, actually pull this off um, and it's taken a lot longer than I thought and we've got a long a lot more to do ahead of us um, but yeah the bank sale is one of like as I think about the things I, I most misjudged in starting the company the bank sale is definitely like if not number one top two for sure uh, and the challenge with selling to banks is they're just like it's one of the hardest sales that's out there if not, if not the hardest um, you know, very big organizations, very conservative around um, use of data, um, really strict information security standards. Um, you know, 
big um, cross-functional organizations where you have to get a really big bench of people bought into to an idea. Um, they're not issuing RFPs to solve this problem. We right. gotta like catalyze the sale ourselves. Uh, and then, you know, every 12 or so months, like the CEO likes to hit the big red button and all of a sudden the whole organization just kind of shifts and who you thought was your sponsor and consumer is all of a sudden working on like small business lending or who you thought was your sponsor and credit cards is now working on auto. And so like for a sales cycle that takes, you know, a year plus, like there's a great, there's a high likelihood that who you think is your sponsor and who's actually supporting you is actually not going to be by the time you actually sign the deal. Um, and that just makes these sales really, really hard. What's the like ballparking? What's the chance of like a, I don't know, button push, like explode the project, like experiences that you had as a business? Um, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, we're, we're, we're launching with a, one of the top top five U.S. card issuers um, in a few weeks, and um, that's been several years in the making. Obviously, the pandemic extended that um, by you know probably added a year and a half to our sale process. Um, but we went through three rounds of executive turnover. Um, so who we thought was our sponsor um, is uh, is no longer at, at the bank. Then who we thought our sponsor is no longer there, and then who we thought who our sponsor was. So we had to each time win them over, get it done, win over their teams, and each time like they were gone. And so you kind of have to like always build your bench of support and find your footing, um, which is a process. Like there's a there's a methodology to how you do that, um, but it takes a lot of a lot of energy and time to move these big deals forward. Um, but in theory, once you win them, once you're plugged in, you're not getting you're not getting unplugged, and so it, it sets the foundation for you know a really really exciting and attractive business. Can you elaborate on the details of what it takes to build and, like, I guess, win the rapport for all these different like, parties within these larger corporations? Like h how you build those relationships? Yeah, how do you build those relationships and how do you, how do you um, transition when the scenarios where when someone, I guess, leaves the company that you're still able to keep rapport with someone inside the company so that you can at least attempt to rebuild? Yeah. Um, so, like, to, to get started, um, I, I find the most powerful thing to just find a internal ally who's not too senior, um, who will take the time to explain the organization. So like he, he, all the way up to the CEO of the entire company, um, you know, how does the organization work? Where are the power centers? Who are the decision makers? Um, you know, what, how do those orgs work cross-functionally? What are the processes? That they go through to make a decision, a set of decisions required to, 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 um, you know, enable our product. That takes a fair bit of time, um, <clears throat> and then you got to figure out your like wish list of, you know, hopefully like sub ten people, but in, in more likely like twenty to fifty people that you have to figure out how to get in front of, um, and you know, as a as a seed or Series A stage company, like that sale is being led by the founders um, and in many ways it still is today <clears throat> um, and so getting you know getting in front of those people is a lot of time um, and you got to find a warm introduction ideally as far up the organization as, as you can through you know through your network somehow or your investors and sell the dream like Pitch them on like why this matters, and for for us the the pitch, um, and you know to the extent there's any bank executives listening, um, you'll, you'll 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 hear it here, um, is that every year there are several million people who move to the U.S. Um, that subset of people is uh, accounts for the majority of U.S. population growth. So um, that means that there are more people that move to the U.S. every year than there are Americans who turn 18 and become eligible for financial services. And so not having a strategy for how to attract and retain the recent immigrant segment is a formula to demographically lose market share over time. Like you have to have a strategy to win this mm -hmm. segment. Banks are increasingly creating strategies around universe expansion, multicultural banking and immigrant banking. Um, and if this is the source of population growth, um, then like you have to have a strategy for it on a retail basis and on a digital basis. And then, 
getting into the numbers, like if you're a top 10 issuer, let's say you have a you know a 10% market share within cards, we're talking about, you know, would it be valuable to unlock the opportunity, the ability to digitally approve 100,000, 200,000 incremental accounts a year? Um, and every one of those accounts is worth, depending on you know the product, hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Hmm. Uh, and so it turns into like a really, um, really compelling business case of unlocking hundreds of millions of dollars of value on a recurring annualized basis that's betting on the future demographics of, of this country. What's your percentage of your time that you spend, call it on a year-to-year -year basis, on establishing these partnerships so that you can, um, I guess, build these um, like revenue streams for them, or I hope to build them? Um, so like what, what percentage of my time am I spending on like go to market? Um, depends on the year, uh, depends on the month. Um, um, anywhere from like 25 to 50%, um, probably on average. And then certain like early days, um, probably over 50% of just like mm -hmm. continuing to try to like build relationships and like frankly, cause, cause that's how you learn and get the customer feedback on like, what are the next set of major features you're gonna have to need, you're gonna have to win to, um, to, to, to develop in order to win, win, win this partnership. And like when you're just starting and totally naive and new to, to an industry, like you just don't even know what you don't know yet. So one of the things I noticed on your website is that you're primarily focused on a small set of countries right now. How do you choose to narrow down your focus to specific countries? Like was it because of ease of uh, partnership establishment? Is it ease of convincing American lenders that this data is valid? Like, what, what are some of the data points you use to choose these countries? Um, so on, on our, um, so today we've got about 20, 20 markets on the platform. Um, so through those markets, we're able to um, tap into over over one billion credit records, um, which is, to my knowledge, more than any company um, in the world, and. Uh, that set of countries accounts for the majority of the annual inflow of, uh, of recent immigrants. So, um, if you, um, you know, and, and just to, to, to share a little bit more about that, so we're talking about India, Mexico, Canada, the UK, Australia, Nigeria, Kenya, um, China, Korea, like the, the markets that like instinctively you're like, yeah, there's a lot of people from those countries, like. Those are the ones we have. Um, okay. There's also like a data-driven approach to how, how you rank, and that's you know you look at uh, visa statistics from the State Department, and you figure out which visas are the relevant visas, so people that are coming here uh, with the intent to stay, and you can actually like determine this is all public data how many people move from the U.S. from India to the U.S. every year. India is number one. India is about 18 percent of the market. Mexico's number two or three, depending on how you look at it. Then it's Canada and China, depending on how you look at it. Then it's the UK. And so we just, we went down the list and we we're like, okay, like let's go knock out the biggest contributors to US immigration because that's how we have the most impact and that's how we create the best business case and being able to solve this problem for the most amount of people. As far as I'm aware, your monetization strategy is to collect, I don't know, some sort of like, I don't know, um, like fee from partner fee from lenders whom you're like giving them leads to or giving them customers for how many how many years did it take to get your i guess first like on a dollar of revenue from this model so on our our, our core business is actually like a pure enterprise facing business where we're a piece of infrastructure that is so i, I can speak about american express that's a, it's a public partnership for us so like you, you doesn't matter whether you've heard of Nova Credit before or not. If you apply for any of American Express's U.S. consumer cards, um, that that application is powered by our capability. Gotcha. Uh, if you don't have sufficient U.S. history, you're given the opportunity to plug in your foreign history to get approved. Now, on hmm. top of that, we also get a lot of organic traffic of people who know this know about this problem or want to solve this problem. And then we can also route them to our partners, American Express being one of them, 
uh, to then get them you know, approved through the, the American Express application where we're plugged in into their infrastructure. So there's kind of like se several business models here, but the, the core B2B enterprise facing one is, is the core, the consumer facing more like Credit Karma-like capabilities is a relatively small part of our business, even though it dominates our, our uh, public facing website. I see, I see. But to, coming back to your question, like how long did it take to get first revenue? From like initial idea, um, almost two years. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I thought to get the first dollar um, from incorporation, just over a year. Um, but yeah, it takes time. I mean, build, building these parts because like it took a it took a very long time to build these bureau relationships and uh, building all the integrations is just like it takes a lot of engineering horsepower. Um, like the, a typical fintech spends over a year building a credit bureau integration, and we've got over twenty of them. <laughs> like it's a lot of work. One of the things I love about talking to entrepreneurs who tackle very like niche spaces or blue oceans is that their perspective is very unique and have a lot of knowledge that doesn't really exist anywhere else. What are some of the things that you wish you knew, caught like three to five years ago, before I guess that you've learned recently, but you wish you knew prior. Um, I wish somebody told me how hard it was to uh, recruit engineers, um, mm. particularly right now. The market is just like super tight, um, and um, you know, ultimately, like a, a business's potential and success is a function of its team. Like, if you don't, if you don't have a, a world class team and a world class organization that's that's aligned around a set of objectives, like you don't have anything. Like, you have to have that. Um, other things we've learned, um, don't try to do too much at the same time. I mean, it's kind of like an obvious platitude, but um, you know, we learned it the hard way of probably like two years in, we're like, we're gonna sell to banks, we're gonna sell into real estate, oh yeah, and we're gonna expand into Canada. That didn't work, like, it's just too much for such a small team to take on at the same time. Um, so being very methodical about like one major initiative at a time and work on that as hard and fast as you can. And if it's not working, move to, move to the next one. Um, and like, obviously there is no perfect formula to determine whether something is or isn't working. So you gotta like trust your gut and like you've got 80% of the information or whatever the, you know, the, the platitude is on that one um, pretty quickly. And so like, you, you, gotta, you gotta trust your instincts on that. Um, what else? Um, be like thoughtful about like where are the, um, who are the mega connectors in your space? Um, like wh who are the people that are gonna know all of your buyers? Um, and how can you get in front of those people and you know, build like a partnership with them or you know, bring them onto your advisory board? Um, because like connectivity in an enterprise facing business is like so, 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 so important to accelerating your sale. Because you can spend months or quarters just trying to get in front of the right person. If you can shave that down to a couple weeks and start to establish a relationship with the right set of introductions, you can cut down the length of your sale like pretty dramatically. So what did you end up doing to solve the hiring of engineers problem? Like what is your current strategy to hire engineers or what have you done in the past? Brute force. <laughs> I, I don't think there's an, like a really elegant solution there. Like you just got to put in the hours. You got to, I mean, f foundationally you have to, you know, build a great company, organization, mission, culture that attracts um, people that want to drive results and um, but want to work in an environment where you know every hour of work that they put it put in is having a greater impact on society. I think if like if you can't tell that narrative in an authentic way, you can't attract and retain the premier engineering talent that's out there. Like you need to believe that, you know, and we're like deep in the bowels of creating systemic change. Like we build global data pipelines that, you know, enable some of the biggest banks in the world to connect to the credit bureaus around the world to help, you know, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, like soon hopefully millions of people get access to financial services that are otherwise shut out of the system. Mm -hmm. And so being able to like tell a purpose driven thesis in an environment about uh, working in a company environment where you know you will be pushed you will learn you will you will grow um, and there is opportunity for you know uh, advancement as you, as you go and, like that has to be true 
Um, and then like assuming that, that that is the case, that like if you are able to excite somebody enough to like take a look, that they'll be excited about what they find, then it's, just, it's, it's a numbers game of like how do you, how do you build and, and optimize a recruiting funnel um, to outbound as many engineers as you can who, who, who could be um, great contributors to your organization and run that process as efficiently um, as you can. How many engineers do you have? Um, about 25. Okay. And imagine that was a rough, rough slog to get all oh, 25. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I mean if, if, you, if anybody joining an early, an early stage company, and like by many regards, we're still an early stage company, um, it's a big life decision. So it's a, it's a big life decision to bet, you know, hopefully a few years of your life on, you know, an early stage opportunity that, you know, has a lot of upside, um, but on a, you know, on a cash basis, like we can't compete with some of the big, you know, big tech companies out there, like no early stage company really can. Uh, and so you really have to have to sell the opportunity, have to really get people excited about how much they're gonna learn, how they're gonna grow, how they're gonna be in the trenches with an amazing group of people. Um, and that's like, that's hard. Like for every individual person in the organization, not, not only on the engineering team, like that, they made a big life decision to come work with us on like bringing this mission to life. And like, I'm incredibly grateful for, for that. Um, but it's a big decision. And so being very methodical about how, about your offer process and, um, you know, helping somebody make the right decision for them, not to like, you know, trick them into joining the company only to then find out that like this or that is a mess. Like you have to be transparent uh, from, from the onset because like it doesn't do anybody service for them to feel tricked and then not want to be at the company. Like it's just a waste of calories for everybody. So like you have to be transparent about it uh, and make that experience feel really special. So as you transition from, you, you mentioned raising a series B recently, correct? Yeah, just over a year ago. Over a year ago. How did you know how many people you wanted on the team? Like how did you know it was the right time to hire the 25th engineer versus just having 24 engineers versus just having 20 engineers or uh, same thing applies to every other domain as well. Like what do you know to hire an additional person in an X domain? We've got a really ambitious roadmap okay. that we want to hit and, and build. Like there's just so much opportunity in the world of credit data infrastructure where, you know, we want to build more and we want to build faster. Um, and so I think we've got I actually don't know how many engineering recs up, definitely over 10 uh, right now. Like we're, we're trying to grow the team as fast as we can. Um, and so any, 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 any folks listening that are considering um, you know, uh, new opportunities, like feel free to just email me, me directly. Uh, more than happy to have a conversation and share a little bit more about uh, what we're building. But it's, uh, you know, I, I think we've been fortunate to always have an incredible, like, to be well capitalized as a company. And so we can, as a result, invest in growth and growing our team, like, pretty aggressively. Well, thanks for your time. This has been a, a great hour. I think I've learned a lot, and I, I love learning about new industries. This is one of the reasons that my, probably the favorite part about learning and being the host of a show is you get to hear about all these different stories. Um, so I'm grateful for your time, and I just want to end all of my calls the same way. Uh, what's the best way for our viewers to get in touch with you if that's something they would like to do? Um, well, first of all, David, thank you for, for having me. It's been a, a real a real pleasure. Um, this this podcast felt very like very chill. Um, with I love I love chill the conversation, uh, which was good. Um, get in touch with me. Just send me an email, Misha at NovaCredit.com. I'm very responsive um, over email, and um, if I can't help you, someone on the team certainly certainly can. And getting you the information um, you need. We're looking for you know um, people who are excited about this ecosystem of um, helping people get approved for credit. Like the, the mission of the company is about creating a fair and inclusive financial system, um, not only here in the U.S. but but for the world. Um, and there's a lot of complexity around how you make that happen. But at the end, at the end of the day, like technology is what's going to make that possible. Technology is what's going to allow people to um, put their best foot forward and get approved um, for, for the financial products they need, especially in the moments when they need the most.